Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. And I am seeing you once again with lecture 15 of novel 2, that is modern novel. What we are going to discuss today, we are going to talk about a new text, a new novel, a um, lot of flies. And interesting thing is that the novel is full of adventure and you are going to enjoy reading this text with me. Um, in today's talk, we are going to have an introduction, rather a detailed introduction of the novel, Lord of the Flies, that is written by William Golding. Um, Lord of the Flies is basically an allegory and an adventure, and um, it's, a, it's a story that casts away fiction. It's about loss of innocence fiction. Uh, the narrative is set in early 1950s um, Salisbury, England. The story is told by an anonymous third-person narrator who conveys the events of the novel without commenting on the action or intruding into the story. So in a way you are going to have a sharp contrast with uh, the, the previous text we uh, recently um, have gone through by Virginia Woolf. Uh, in where you would find Virginia Woolf interrupting um, readers' uh, interpretation by uh, adding her own commentary about situations and letting us understand how she observes and she um, perceives uh, and understand uh, people. However, in, in this text, things are going to be altogether different as William Golding narrates the story um, where he does not um, enter into the understanding process between the text and the reader. Well, um, before that we move on with the story and before we, we discuss um, the other um, important as aspects, we need to understand that what are the characteristics of this particular narrative. Um, the type of this narrative is um, in the third person that I've already mentioned and it primarily focuses on Ralph's point of view but following Jack and Simon in certain episodes. I have taken three names and these are three major characters in the story. Um, very soon I am going to talk about the story itself but just to um, orient you with the story that it's a story about a group of children who get lost um, on an island and, and then how do they cope up with the life there, how do they manage to go through the problems and how do they work circumstances in their favor. That is all we are going to discuss in the story um, and it's a kind of um, and I won't reveal all the, uh, all the facts over here, but Ralph, Jack and Simon are um, some of the major characters that you are going to read in the story. Um, the narrator is omniscient and gives us access to the characters inner thoughts. Again, the bit that is going to be familiar with you is the use of stream of consciousness, um, a technique um, famous for writings of Virginia Woolf that we, you have recently gone through. So you will also find the flavor of the stream of consciousness in this story. Well, the story is presented in, um, in a dark, violent, pessimistic, tragic, unsparing, and set in a de desert tropical island. Now, all these aspects are to be discussed in detail, but since for now we are only getting ourselves oriented with the novel, I am giving you the headers that you are further going to explore in future while we'll be covering this narrative. Um, we know that each narrative is made of um, certain conflicts. Some are minor and some are major in, ca uh, in their characteristics. Um, si similar is this with, with this story that um, Lord of Flies has three major conflicts uh, going in, in the narrative. The very first one is, it shows that the world is free from the rules, or it has to be, or it should be, or what if would be. So these all are um, underlined questions and um, um, ideas and philosophies put forward by William Golding um, in this narrative that adult society formally imposed on um, rules on um, people, on society. Uh, which they think are, uh, are not able to be part of that um, authority group. Then second 
major conflict that you will find in the story is that the boys marooned on the island struggle with the conflicting human instincts that exist within each of them. Each character is representative in, uh, in his own nature and you will find each character representing one stubborn, strict and bold characteristics of society of 20th century. The third conflict is the instinct to walk towards civilization. That's a human instinct um, that man wants to get civilized for certain reasons, for his own reasons, for his own benefits, for a, for a discipline in life, for peace in life and order and the instinct to descend into savagery violence and chaos. However, on the other um, side of the picture you will find that the same man has um, this will of getting into savagery, creating violence and chaos in the society. So we have both sides of the picture very well presented and portrayed by William Golding and you would enjoy going through that. Um, the plot has different steps and stages like uh, traditional narratives and you will see uh, a rising of action where the story somewhere starts or the, the real drama somewhere starts where the boys assemble on the beach, um, beach where the island they get lost in the election for leader and they are since there is an instinct to have some kind of discipline um, they try to or one of them basically voice out his opinion that there should be some election for leaders. Ralph defeats Jack and with this defeat the very first conflict takes its birth. Who is furious when he loses and we find Jack getting furious because of his defeat. As the boys explore the island um, and here you enter into the second main stage of the story, tension grows between Jack who is interested only in hunting, hunting, destroying and creating chaos. And Ralph who believes most of the boys efforts should go toward building shelters and maintaining a signal fire, looking for some kind of discipline, looking for survival, working towards peace. And then in the next stage you will find that when rumors surface that there is some sort of beast living on the island, the boys grow fearful and the group begins to divide into two camps supporting Ralph and Jack and finally the, the conflict that took birth in the very first stage, it keeps on growing and growing and it takes shape of two opposing opinions that now have support of um, people. And ultimately what happens is that Jack forms a new tribe altogether and fully immerse, immersing himself in the savagery of the hunt. And there we find um, after these three stages of rising action you find a stage which can be called or which can be known or enjoyed as climax and climax is further divided into three steps again in a rising action and you find that Simon encounters a lot of the flies in forest um, glad and realizes that the beast is not a physical entity but rather something that exists within each boy on the island and that's a kind of ironical presentation that William Golding brings into our attention that um, when in search of finding the beast what is fi found out that the beast inside every human being and then we find that when Simon tries to approach the other boy and convey the message to them they fall on him and kill him in their savagery and here the peak of the climax comes up so when the, when the peak of climax comes up, from here you will see there is a falling action. And here falling action is given two um, separate division, two steps of falling. Virtually all the boys on the island abandon Ralph and piggy and descend further into savagery and chaos. Now what happens that after um, all the boys are divided into two major groups. One is one that belongs to Ralph and other that belongs to Jack. In the end, Piggy remains to be the only um, companion of Ralph's group. 
and rest of the boys, all of them for one reason or another, move to Jack's tribe. So when the other boy kills Piggy, and what happens in the end, that Piggy is also killed by the savage tribe. So when they kill Piggy and destroy the count shell, and um, count shell keeps a very significant place in the story, and we will definitely bring this into our discussion. So what happens that when the count shell is destroyed, Ralph flees from Jack's tribe and encounters the naval officer on the beach, and that closes the story. So this was a uh, this there were these were some of the major details of the plot and how the plot is designed and what are the major uh, events that you are going to come across. Um, now we need to have a word about the theme of the novel and what are the themes, what are the philosophies that William Golding wanted to bring forward um, in his um, masterpiece. Well, the major themes that can be found very easily or that, that, that are commonly discussed are civilization versus savagery, the loss of innocence, and innate human evil, evil that resides inside every human being. And um, we understand that themes are further enhanced and structured with the help of symbols and motifs. So here you have a couple of symbols which um, do not only add meaning into the themes and um, knit the plot together um, and stronger, uh, they also bring um, twist in story at, at many places. You will find several biblical parallels. You will find natural beauty as a motif. You will find the bullying of the weak by the strong. You will find the outward trappings of savagery, like face paints, spears, tom totems, and charms. Well, this makes us have um, a look at the symbols as well and see how do they play their role in the story. You see, um, the major symbol in the story is the conch shell, um, a kind of um, an equipment to um, blow your voice into it and it uh, reflects with an echo and you are able to convey your voice to many um, um, other than it is possible in a normal situation when you are just articulating something. It's a kind of microphone, a natural microphone that helps you convey your, throw your voice as far as possible. Now, um, the second major symbol is Piggy's glasses. Um, you will, when you will read the story, and I advise you to start reading the story and try to finish it up before you come with me in the next lecture, so you are better able to understand uh, whatever is happening. You will find, and one more interesting thing that I would like to add here is that you're not only going to read the story, I'm, I'm trying my best to provide you with the visual of based on this uh, narrative. And it's going to be very um, interesting watch for sure because that's all an adventure. Um, you will find that Piggy's glasses are um, very symbolic in nature. Somewhere they are, they are part of um, their survival too because they, these glasses, uh, spectacles help boys lit fire. That is important for their survival, that is important for survival in the island and survival in coming back from the island because they use fire as a fire signal too. Then the fire signal is, uh, uh, in itself is another symbol being used by William Golding. The beast is another. The Lord of the Flies, again the title is very symbolic in nature. And finally Ralph, Piggy, Jack, Simon and Roger are representative figures, symbolic figures used by William Golding. Well this was a... Um, a precise introduction of the of the novel written by William Golding, Lord of the Flies, and here what we discussed is we discussed the type of um, the some facts about the novel, and we also discussed the major details regarding the plot, and we touched upon the themes, motives, and symbols and discussed in the story. Now let us have a detailed uh, look into the contextual background of the story so we are in a better position and we hold strong grounds in order to um, position ourselves in understanding the writing by William Golding. 
So when I say contextual background, we definitely need to have some understanding of the writer too. Um, William Golding was born on September 1990 11 in Cornwall, England. So again, uh, you will see the writer uh, since he uh, covers um, the most of 20th century in his youth. So you will again have a flavor of a writer who is experiencing the time of 20th century and narrating it as well in his writings. Although he tried to write a novel as early as age 12, um, his parents urged him to study the natural sciences. Um, now you see a kind of dichotomous affair here. His parents wanted to move him into natural sciences, however, what he leads to um, towards is literature. Golding followed his parents' wishes until he his second year at Oxford when he changed his focus to English literature finally. After graduating from Oxford, he worked briefly as a, as a theater actor and director and wrote poetry and then be became a um, school teacher. Well, in 1940, a year after England entered World War II, so um, indirectly we are given this clue that the writer has her, his experience of World War II. So all the chaos, all the destruction, all the savagery you will find in the story is basically reflection of those hard times that the um, people from 20th century have gone through. Um, so this was the time when Golding joined the Royal Navy where he served in command of a rocket launcher and participated in the invasion of Normandy. So now we have a clue of the presence of Navy in the, in the story since the writer has a close association with the force. Um, he uh, tried to incorporate it, his association in his writing as well. That is one kind of interpretation. Golding's experience in World War II had a profound effect on his view of humanity and the evils of which it was capable. After the war, Golding resumed teaching and started to write novels. So it was a kind of, um, uh, you can say, a kind of break in his um, expression of writing in his in his habit of writing and during that time he had been teaching uh, his first and greatest success came with Lord of the Flies in 1954 so we find that Golding was born in 1911 and he started writing in the age of 12 so roughly it makes that he started writing somewhere in 1923 or 24 However, his major contribution um, came up in 1954, almost 25 years after his writing. So he has um, gone through definitely tough and hard times in order to polish his uh, skills, which ultimately become a bestseller in both Britain and the United States after more than 20 publishers rejected it. So even this bestseller, even this masterpiece got rejection from 20 publishers of the time because of the conflicting um, situations being part of the story. The novel's sale enabled Golding to retire from teaching and devote himself entirely and fully to writing. Golding wrote several more novels, notably um, Pincher Martin and a play, The Brass Butterfly, in 1958. Um, although he never matched the popular and critical success he enjoyed with Lord of the Flies, he remained a respected and distinguished author for the rest of his life and was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1983. And finally, Golding um, died in 1993, um, one of the most acclaimed writers of the second half of the 20th century. Lord of the Flies, now, a bit, after having a word about the writer, we need to have a word about the contextual uh, background associated with the novel as itself. Lord of the Flies tells the story of a group of English schoolboys uh, marooned on a tropical island after their plane is shot during um, a war. The plane was shot down. 
Though the novel is fictional in nature, its exploration of the idea of human evil is at least partly based on Golding's experience, his personal experience with the real life, violence and brutality of World War II. Free from the rules and structures of civilization and society, the boys on the island in Lord of the Flies descends into savagery. This makes the bottom line of the story. As the boys splinter into, into um, factions, some behave peacefully and work together to maintain order and discipline and eventually achieve common goals, while others rebel and seek only anarchy and violence. In his portrayal of the small world of the island of these boys, Golding points a broader portrait of the fundamental human struggle between the civilization instinct, the impulse to obey rules, behave morally and act lawfully, and the savage instinct, the impulse to seek brute power over others, act selfishly, scorn moral rules and indulge in violence, apparently for no logical reasons. Golding employs a relatively straightforward writing style in Lord of the Flies, one that avoids highly poetic language, lengthy descriptions or complicated punctuations like you would have experienced in Virginia Woolf's writing and philosophical interludes. Much of the novel is uh, allegorical, meaning that the characters and objects in the novel are infused with symbolic significance that conveys the novel's central theme and idea. In general, novel is a, kind of, is a kind of treat in reading. It's simple to understand and it gives pleasure when you read it first without concentrating on its contextual background. However, once you get to know what are the hidden uh, objectives and themes conveyed, you get to praise the writer's technique and skill. In portraying the various ways in which the boys on the island adapt to their new surroundings and react to their new freedom, Golding explores the broad spectrum of ways in which humans respond to stress, change and tension. Readers and critics have interpreted Lord of the Flies in widely varying ways over the years since its publication. During the 1950s and 60s, many readings of the novel claimed that Lord of the Flies dramatizes the history of civilization. Some believe that the novel explores fundamental religious issues such as original sin and the nature of good and evil. However, others approached Lord of the Flies through the theories of the psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud, who taught that the human mind was the site of a constant battle among different impulses, the ID, inst instinctual needs and desire, the, the ego, it's the it, the ego um, and superego, the conscious rational mind and the sense of conscious, conscience and morality. So this definitely would remind you of Segment Freud's, uh, Freud's um, psycho um, theory that in, in includes um, the id, the ego and the superego. And it's beautifully incorporated in the story, in the narrative by, by William Golding. Well, um, another, there is another group um, keeping uh, these two in view um, that, that maintains that Golding wrote the novel as a criticism of the political and social institution of the West. Ultimately, there is some validity to each of these different readings and interpretations of Lord of the Flies. Although Golding's story is confined to the um, macrosome of a group of boys, it resounds with implications far beyond the bounds of the small island and explores problems and questions universal to the human experience. So, um, in the midst of a um, raging war, now, um, I'm going to give you now details of the story. Uh, so far we have been discussing the contextual background. So after the contextual background, 
a detailed discussion about that. Now we need to have a talk a um, bit about the plot in detail. Although I've already given you a kind of um, skeleton of the plot where I discuss the rise of um, action, the climax and the falling action. Now we are going to see what are the minute details uh, given in the story. Well, the story starts when in the, in, in a, in the midst of a raging war, a plane um, evocating a group of schoolboys from Britain is shot down over a deserted tropical island. Two of the boys, Ralph and Piggy, discover a count shell on the beach and Piggy realizes it could be used as a horn to summon the other boys. Once assembled, the boys set about electing a leader and devising a way to be rescued. They chose Ralph as their leader initially and Ralph um, appoints another boy, Jack, to be in charge of the boys who will hunt food for the entire group. Ralph, Jack and another boy, Simon, set off on an expedition to explore the island. When they return, Ralph declares that they might light they must light rather a signal fire to attract the attention of passing ships eventually to get rescued. The boys succeed in igniting some dead wood by focusing sunlight through the lenses of piggy spectacles. However, the boy more uh, the boys pay more attention to playing than to monitoring the fire and the flames quickly engulf the forest. A large swath of dead wood burns out of control and one of the youngest boys in the group disappears, presumably having burned to death. At first what happens is that the boys enjoy their life without groans up, without any monitoring, without any rules and regulation, without any parents being around or without um, any teachers being around and spend much of their time splashing in the water, playing games and enjoying. Ralph, however, complains that they should be maintaining the signal fire and building huts for shelter, huts, shelter for survival and fire for their going back to the world. The hunters fail in their attempts to catch a wild pig, a pig for their food. But their leader, Jack, becomes increasingly preoccupied with the act of hunting. When a ship passes by on the horizon one day, Ralph and Piggy notice to their horror that the signal fire which they wanted to lit and keep litting to attract the attention of the passing ships had been... Uh, now when the ship was passing by, which had been the hunter's responsibility to maintain, has burned out completely. Furious Ralph um, accosts Jack, but the hunter has just returned with his first kill and so happy and overwhelmed by his happiness that he does not listen to um, Ralph at all. And all the hunter, hunters seem gripped with a strange frenzy um, reenacting the the chase in a kind of wild dance and they so overwhelmed by their victory and excitement that they are not listening anything um, anything wise said by uh, Ralph and Piggy. So what happens that Piggy who is a kind of bold um, articulator criticizes Jack who hits Piggy in return across the face. Ralph blows the conch shell and reprimands the boy in a speech intended to restore order, since discipline was something to be maintained for their own peace. At the meeting, it quickly becomes clear that some of the boys have started to become afraid. Afraid of whom? That is a question you need to answer. The littlest boys, known as little uns, have been troubled by nightmares from the beginning and more and more boys now believe that there is some sort of beast or monster um, lurking on the island. The older boy tries to convince the others at the meeting to think rationally asking where such a monster could possibly hide during the daytime. 
One of the little ones suggests that it hides in the sea, a proposition that terrifies the entire group. Not long after the meeting, some military planes engage in a battle high above the island. The boys asleep below do not notice the flashing lights and explosions in the clouds. A, part, a, a parachute drifts to earth on the signal fire mountain dead. Sam and Eric, the twin responsible for watching the fire and taking care that it's continuously litting, uh, at night are asleep and do not see the parachute landing. When the twins wake up, they see the enormous sellout of his parachute and hear the strange flapping noises it makes. Thinking the island beast is at hand, they rush back to the camp in terror and report that the beast has attacked them. The boys organize a hunting expedition to search for the monster. Jack and Ralph, who are increasingly an odds, travel up the mountain together. They see the um, sellout of the parachute from a distance and think that it looks like a huge deformed ape. The group holds a meeting at which Jack and Ralph tell the others of the uh, citing, Jack says that Ralph is a coward and that he should be removed from office, from this leadership. But the other boys refuse to vote Ralph out of power. And this happens towards the end when almost all the boys physically took side of Jack's tribe. Jack angrily runs away down the beach, calling all the hunters to join him. Ralph release the remaining boys to build a new signal fire, this time on the beach rather than on the mountain. They obey, but before they have finished the task, most of them have slipped away to join Jack. Maybe they got into a second thought. Jack declares himself the leader of the new tribe of hunters and organizes a hunt and a violent ritual slaughter of a sow to solemnize the occasion. The hunters then um, decapitate the sow and place its head on a, sh on a sharpened stake in the jungle as an offering to the beast. So later encountering the bloody fly covered head, Simon head of the beast, um, rather head of the pig, Simon has a terrible vision, during which it seems to him that the head is speaking. The voice which he imagines as belonging to the Lord of the Flies says that Simon will never escape him, for he exists within all men. Simon faints. When he wakes up, he goes to the mountain where he sees the dead parachutes. Understanding then that the beast does not exist externally but rather within each individual boy, Simon travels to the beast to tell the others what he has seen and that's quite a tragic scene in the story. But the others are in the midst of a chaotic revelry. Even Ralph and Piggy have joined Jack's feast and when they see Simon's shadowy figure emerge from the jungle, they fall upon him and in doubt kill him with their bare hands and teeth. That's the most savage part of the narrative. The following morning, Ralph and Piggy discuss what they have done. Jack's hunters attack them and their fe few, fellows, um, few followers and steal Piggy's glasses in the process because here they want to let fire. And since Piggy was with Ralph, they could not have access to Piggy's spectacles in order to do so. Ralph's group travels to Jack's stronghold in an attempt to make Jack see reason. But Jack orders Sam and Eric tied up in fights with Ralph. In the, in in the um, ensuing battle, one boy, Roger, rolls a boulder down the mountain, it's a big kind of rock, killing Piggy and shattering the count's shell. 
So, Ralph barely managed to escape a torrent of spears. And what happens now that Ralph is all alone being victimized by Jack's tribe, tribe of hunters, um, group of savage boys. Ralph heads for the rest of the night and the following day while the other hunts him like an animal. Jack has the other boys ignite the forest in order to smoke Ralph out of his hiding place. Um, and it's, it's not one place they're, they're where Ralph is hiding. He's basically moving and shifting from one place to another all the time. Ralph stays in the forest, however, where he discovers and destroys the sow's head. But eventually, he is forced out onto the beach where he knows the other boys will soon arrive to kill him like Piggy. Ralph collapses in, exhaust in exhaustion, but when he looks up, miraculously, he sees a British naval officer standing over him. The officer's ship noticed the fire raging in the jungle. And this is how the boy is escaped. The other boys reach the beach and stop in their tracks at the sight of the officer. Amazed at the spectacle of this group of bloodthirsty, savage children, the officer asks Raph to explain. Raph is overwhelmed by the knowledge that he is safe now, but thinking about what has happened on the island, he begins to weep. The other boys begin to sob as well. The officer turns his back so that the boys may regain their composure. And this was all about the details regarding the plot. Now, what we are going to discuss in the next section, we are going to have a detailed discussion on chapter development. And um, I hope when you'll be reading the story and will finish it by yourself, you'll be even more clear about all the details. And this discussion will help you point out questions if they rise into your mind. So let's start with our this detailed discussion on chapters that includes um, chapter 1 till 7. Well, when our story begins, um, the fair boy makes his way out of a jungle and toward a lagoon. A red and yellow bird flashes upward with a witch-like cry. Just as another youngster, the fat boy who is wearing thick spectacles follows behind. This is how you are going to learn in the reading and as well as in the visual too. Um, and this chapter is basically named as the sound of the shell. The two boys meet and discuss the fact that, holy smokes, their plane has crashed. The fat boy wonders where the man with the megaphone is, which we should all keep in mind for the next few paragraphs. Um, also, there are no grown-ups. Also, they can't find the plane or the pilot. The fair boy concludes that both must have been dragged out to sea by a storm. He makes the dire statement that there must have been some kids still in it. It begins the plane that went out to sea. And later on, we get to know who this fat boy is, who this fair boy is. The fat boy, seriously, that's what he's called. Ask the fair boy again, that's what he's called, what his name is. It's Ralph. Ralph has no interesting interest, interest in learning the fat boy's name. But the pair assumes others have survived and are around here somewhere. And it's the time when no one could see anyone except the boy, Ralph and Piggy. Only these could to see each other on the island and not know if there are other any other boys on the island. Maybe hiding in the in the in the copious foliage or something. The fat boy lags behind Ralph because of his um, uh, fear, which is probably and also his disease that he keeps is asthma. Um, also the fat boy has to um, 
answer to his nature call. So what he's doing, he's trying to stay back and giving way to Ralph to initiate. Ralph races ahead to the water and we get a detailed description of the shore, the palm trees, the coarse grass and the decaying coconuts. This is all in contrast to the darkness of the force. So what happens that Ralph decides the thing to do is have a swim. While we are busy getting a description of Ralph, the fat boy shows up and joins in the swimming fun. The water is warmer than their blood, like swimming in a huge uh, bath. So a delightful hot tub if you ignore the blood imagery. We get a nice description of Ralph. He is 12 and has the build of maybe being a boxer someday when he's older. But you can also plainly see that there is no devil in him and he's quite a gentleman. Lastly, he, lastly, he has bright, excited eyes. The fat boy admits um, to Ralph that most people call him Piggy and asks Ralph not to tell anyone. Ralph is not the nicest guy to Piggy. They call you Piggy sort of thing. But we are holding out judgment on him since he is after all a 12 year old boy. Ralph claims that his father who is in the Navy is going to come rescue them. Piggy however says the pilot told them before the crash that an atomic bomb had gone off and everyone was dead. This combined with the earlier megaphone comment suggests that perhaps the boys were being evacu evacuated maybe even from some kind of war zone when the plane crashed. Anyway, Piggy asserts, Piggy asserts that they are probably going to have to um, stay here till die. On this cheerful note, they decide to put their clothes back on after swimming. In doing, so, in doing so, they find a large white count shell, which Piggy remembers is a fox, megaphone. Ralph makes several efforts before an amazing sound comes out of the shell. A deep, harsh boom. As you might expect, man has um, ruined the peaceful stillness of the Virgin Island. Amidst the squawking birds and screwing um, furry things, the other boys come out of the woodwork. Some are very small and little. Many are out of their clothes because they all have been swimming. While Ralph continues to reveal in the violent pleasure of blowing the conch, Piggy goes to great lengths to ask and learn everyone's name. Among them, a young child named Johnny and a pair of twins named Sam and Eric. Ralph sees a dark, fumbling creature but concludes that it is only a group of boys wearing black uh, coil robes. There is a um, red-headed boy at the head of the pack controlling uh, the other boys as well. The boy commands them all to stand in a line. We are thinking it must be rather uncomfortable in the sun to be wearing heavy black cloaks and our suspicions are confirmed when one of the boys faints face first in the sand. The boys ask a red-headed leader, Mary Dew, but can't we Mary Dew, which we think means please let us take off these absurd clocks. Mary Dew ignores the boy who's fainted. Piggy doesn't ask names of this group since they are kind of scary, but he does remind everyone that names are so important. About this time, Ralph tells everyone that Piggy's name is Piggy, and that's quite a fun to uh, face for uh, the fat boy. And now we meet the rest of the, co rest of the cast. We have got Murica, who smiles a lot. Jack, Meridew, the tyrant you already met, and the largest of the choir boys, Roger, who is, who is slight and furtive and has an inner intensity of an, of an avoidance and secrecy. Simon, who has recovered from his fainting spell, and then Bill, Robert, Harold, and Henry. Guess which one is evil in, incarnate. 
Well, Jack says they should work out the um, getting rescued part. Ralph's response is shut up. He decides they need a chief first. Jack declares that most sensibly he should be chief because he is the head boy of the coil and can sing a C sharp which everyone knows will come in handy later when negotiating with foreign peoples. Because they are good British boys who know how to follow, they decide to vote. Amazingly, they pull this off without the aid of an electrical college and um, Ralph becomes chief, although the choir boys did vote for Jack out of obligation. Interestingly, Piggy hesitated to vote for Ralph, probably because Ralph skewed him over with the whole name thing. However, we find later on that Piggy and Ralph both make the most um, popular couple in the story. But why was Ralph elected? What was the reason? You definitely would need to ask about it. Actually, Golding tells us, he says that Ralph has a stillness, is attractive and most importantly has the couch, the power to speak. Ralph feels bad and gives Jack a consolation prize. And no, not a useless voice uh, presidency, but rather control over the choir boys. Jack decides uh, his group, the choir boys, will act as the hunters, hunters to hunt food for the group. Apparently, he's power hungry and blurred thirsty. Ralph, Jack and Simon go off to explore the um, uninhabited island for the purpose of discovering if it is in fact uninhabited. Uh, Piggy offers to go but Jack tells him he's not suited for a job like this. With all the walking and such, Piggy protests but Ralph sends him back to take names. They do find tracks and wonder aloud what made them. Ralph asks, Ralph finally asks, men? And Jack answers, no, animals. Like all good exploring banter, their dialogue is filled with such British wonder as wakao, wizard, and sucks to you. So these are the slangs you will several times find in the story. However, don't get confused. These are just British uh, expressions of showing wonders. The boys find a large rock poised near the edge of the cliff and do the only thing that pre-teen boys could be expected to do in such a circumstance, push it over the edge. It falls like a bomb. They finally climb to the top of the big mountain they have found and look all around at the island and Ralph says, this belongs to us. So finally they make some um, Cartographic observations of the land, nothing the large coral reef and the gash in the trees uh, where their plane hit. On their way back to the lagoon, they find a small pig tangled in the creepers. Jack raises his knife to kill it but can't uh, quite bring himself to and the pig escapes. Jack makes lots of excuses but he thinks next time there will be no mercy. And now here starts the uh, second chapter, Fire on the Mountain. Ralph blows the conch and calls another meeting. By now, um, thank goodness, the choir boys have removed their clocks. Using his authority as the newly elected chief, Ralph tells the boys that they need to get organized. Apparently that means rules. Now all boys have to raise their hands to talk. Oh, and no one can speak unless they are holding the conch shell. So the first few rules are established. The boys are excited. They are very excited about having rules and but mostly so that they can punish those who break them. Not for the reason that they are urging for some kind of discipline. This notion elicits cries of we, who, waku and all the kind of slangs, British slangs to show wonder. You will also get to read bong and doink um, kind of expressions. P 
Piggy takes a conch to raise a few points. They might never get off this island and assuming they don't, they should figure out how to go about the process of not dying. Ralph agrees with the whole on this point and say we might be here until eternity, until ever. But he declares quite clearly that this is a good island. Go ahead and sticky note this page. One small boy with a mulberry colored birthmark, the reason for which will be shortly explained now, requests a conch and everyone laughs until Piggy demands he be allowed to speak. Why shouldn't he be? That's what Piggy says. The kid is too scared to talk in front of everyone and everyone adult. So Piggy acts as translator. He's afraid of a mysterious snake thing in the jungle. He describes it as a, as a beastie and says it comes only in the dark. So apparently the boys must have been on the island for at least one night before they found each other and begin to organize. That's what we can interpret though it's not written in black and white. The other boys snicker and decide that the beastie is just the ropey looking creepers that hang in the trees and they are not snakes. Jack says, of course, there isn't a beast, but just in case, they are all going to go hunt for it anyway. So be aware of, so to get rid of this fear. Ralph is forced to concede, but he insists on making a signal fire. So when his father comes to rescue them on a ship, the men on board will see the smoke and know where to find them. Also burning things is fun. Everyone tears off and Piggy remarks that they're all acting like a bunch of kids. Because they're all a bunch of kids after all. Everyone excitedly piles up the wood before realizing they have no way of starting the fire. Jack very helpfully mumbles something about um, Eagle Scout lesson 2 if you have been counting. And what is this counting lesson? Uh, they use Piggy's glasses to start the fire after many hurrahs and much gathering of wood. Piggy is not happy about the use of his spectacles for this purpose, um, by the way. And what we mean is, um, Piggy's voice rose to a shriek of terror as Jack snatched the glasses off his face. Ralph says that they need to choose certain responsible people to keep the fire going to all times. In case a ship passes by, Jack declares, we are English and the English are best at everything. So the role of gender, the role of um, society and the role of um, nationalities has also been um, discussed um, deeply and thoughtfully in this narrative. Piggy, rather blind without his glasses, grabs the couch from Ralph and complains about how no one pays attention to his idea. While the boys argue, the fire, speed, the fire spreads like wildfire. As the smoke drifts through the air, Piggy rants about all these things they should have done, like build shelters and show him some respect. Then most likely because of the smoke, his asthma flare up, flares up and he can't breathe. And here I'm referring to Piggy, the fat boy. Yes, it seems he has enough, enough breath to point out that the small children, um, the little one seems to be missing, especially that one who complained about the beastie and had a mulberry colored birthmark. The better to distinguish him by when he is gone. He seems to be the most missing of all. And here we start with the next chapter. However, I'm not sure if I'll be able to finish it up today, but I'll just start with it. So if you are reading, it gives you some assistance in that. Time passes by when chapter 3 opens up and we see Jack, his bare back, a mass of dark freckles and peeling sunburns on his face. And he's without clothes, probably uh, keeping only a um, knicker on his self um, or shorts, a pair of tattered shorts rather. Slang alert in British English, shorts means a kind of, um, a kind of short pants. So he's wandering around in his boxer 
briefs. Jack has become obsessed with killing a pig, with killing, hunting, blood shedding and all kind of savage actions, obsessed to the point of tracking down pig droppings. Based on his sniffing the air, uh, the air all the time, it seems that Jack is now a lot like an animal himself or at the least a primitive kind of man. Jack fails to catch a pig yet again he tries to track, take it down on someone else meaning Ralph and Simon who are trying to build shelter out of leaves. It's not going so well as you might have expected. That's what is thought by Jack. So Ralph and Jack do what they always do together. Argue, Jack thinks it's more important to kill things while Ralph thinks it's more important to not to die of exposure or too much exposure rather. Um, Ralph points out that everyone is still scared of the, of the beastie as it is if it wasn't a good island. But did Piggy say it was a good island twice? So Jack too admits he gets a little scared when he's in the jungle alone. Despite all this, Ralph is still mostly concerned with the fire. Oh hey, says Jack, maybe they could paint their faces. Wait, what? See if they had painted faces. They could sneak up on the pigs while they are sleeping. Okay, so that idea comes to Jack. Piggy lies on his stomach and stares at the water, but he does, does point out that Simon is the one helpful guy whenever he's not missing, which he tends to be quite frequently. Um, camera smile, now we are looking at Simon as he walks into the forest with an air of purpose. We are told that his bright eyes made Ralph think he was delightfully happy and wicked when he's not at all. He's also tan, barefoot and has a coarse map of black hair. The little ones follow after him and he helps them pick fruit too, all tall for them to reach before heading deeper into the jungle by himself. Simon comes to a place where the creepers had woven a great mat that hung at the side of an open space in the jungle. He crawls inside the space, um, we cannot imagine why, and chills out there while evening approaches, musing non-specific here. So, this is all that we discussed in today's talk, and in today's talk, what we merely discussed, basically, uh, you got a, a, a an introduction of, of the new text that we have started today in lecture 15, um, Lord of Flies, that is masterpiece and written by William Golding. Uh, this is basically a symbolic writing um, based on allegories and allegorical and uh, narrative as well. And today's talk we try to understand um, the contextual information and contextual background of the writer as well as of the write-up. And we also discuss the um, plot a skeleton by getting into its rising actions, climax and falling actions and we also discussed the plot in detail and now what we have started with, we have started with a detailed analysis of the chapters one by one and in our, in our today's lecture we could hardly cover up our four first chapters of the book. Let's see uh, how soon and how fast we can cover up our lectures, uh, our chapters at the next lecture. However, at the same time, I would like to suggest you and advise you that you make sure that you finish the reading of this novel before you start up with your next lecture. So you are in a better position to understand what is being discussed. This was all for today. I'll see you in the next lecture, lecture 16. Allah Hafiz.